Um, hello everyone, uh, I'm going to talk about a tool, a tool we built in Datalog called KubeHound. So it's going to be identify attack paths into Kubernetes cluster uh, at scale with no hustle. So I am Julian Teriak. Uh, I work uh, in, uh, I'm a team lead of the adversary simulation team in Datalog. I used to do some pen tests. If you didn't manage to identify, I'm French and I would be apologized for my accent for the rest of the presentation. So what I'm going to present is really uh, a team effort. Uh, actually, the lead tech on the project was Jeremy Fox, who now had left the team and joined Oracle as a staff engineer. And also, Edward is also part of the project. I still can pronounce his last name, uh, even though I've been working with him for the past two years. So what we want to tackle as a problem. So first, before jumping into this issue, I want to do some introduction to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So first, what is Kubernetes? Um, Kubernetes is really this orchestration platform made for developers with really cool feature, with high availability, auto scaling, and so on, uh, which allow you to ship containerized application uh, um, pretty easily. So container, you know, it's sandboxes for developers, so not really from a security point of view, but really try to ease the developer experience to try to ship application with all this dependency into this like bubble where you can, you know, it can run on its own with everything it needs. And in the Kubernetes, you can't actually ship Docker's uh, containers, sorry, you ship pods, which is the smallest deployment unit available into the Kubernetes uh, world. Uh, it allows you basically to, 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 yeah, to pack, to pack together container and be able to deploy them into your Kubernetes cluster. And all the no pod actually run on what we call node. And node can be seen as, you know, VM or, machine with host, I mean, that has memory, storage, and so on being defined. Uh, and together, when you group them, we have what we call a Kubernetes cluster. So if I recall again, we have containers that are on pods, pods are on work on nodes, and multiple nodes form what we call the Kubernetes cluster. And everything is being orchestrated by the Kate's uh, API, um, which is the orchestrator of everything. So usually those Kubernetes clusters run on the cloud provider. From this talk, I will not talk, like nothing would be related to cloud provider as we will be focusing only on the Kubernetes cluster world. So fine, now we know that Kubernetes is, what about Kubernetes security? Uh, so of course, we're gonna do some basic one-on-one here again. So we have, I guess most of people know container escape. It just allows you to basically escape from a container and basically allow you to gain more rights that we're not supposed to have inside your own container. Um, you have all the security usually is based on identity because everything that is being run in Kubernetes, especially pod, has a link attached to it at what we call service account. But you can have user account groups that allow you to do stuff uh, or action uh, into your, the Kubernetes. And these are linked to what we call Kubernetes roles. And the role with uh, what we call a role binding allows you to do a set of action, which is called verb, so list, get, exec, whatever, on Kubernetes resources that, for instance, nodes, both secret, endpoint, and so on. Um, and with those roles, you can also do some damage uh, if you have high privilege, such like, you know, secret list, for instance. Um, and the last part we wanted to emphasize is mounted volumes. Uh, the volume is really important into the security world because it's allow you to, you know, bring, uh, build bridges between, for example, a node and a container. So you see you can have directly, you know, link to do some container escape, for instance. So. If I draw again the big picture, uh, you have identity, which you know can allow you to do some privilege education with the role associated to it. You can jump to the nodes through volume, for instance, and you know there are a lot of other attacks. That's like a really, really quick summary, uh, just to give you some hints on what we are going to do and what we want to address with the tool. So, what do we want? What do we want to solve? So. If we do a quick exercise and say we have two vulnerability, and for instance, we have one vulnerability, which is a container escape on a web application, 
uh, it is exposed online. It has pri because it is privileged, so it allows you to uh, yeah, escape from it. And you have on the other hand another container escape, uh, which is on the control plane DNS container of the Kubernetes cluster because it has high C uh, uh, Linux capabilities. What you see is the obvious two, like one is important and the other one we don't really care because, you know, it's built in. Uh, so, but we know that because we have the context around it and we took the time to dig into it. But how, if you had like a thousand of container escape and you want to replicate this way of thinking to every single one of them, why well, it's not really possible. So, for instance, if we have like a big cluster with a lot of, you know, different security flow, and from this, I ask you, give me a, scale, a grade on one to ten or how secure is it? Well, you will not be able to give me any because you don't know the context around it. You don't know how secure is it. Like, is it exposed or stuff like that? So this is where John Lambert actually comes to the rescue. And he has this famous quote, like, I guess a lot of people know in the room. He say, defender second list, attacker sent in grad, and as long as it is true, attacker win. So basically, it is this we took it to the letter, and this is why we want to use this graph way of thinking to what we want to build this security uh, posture. You try, you know, to quantify it, but instead of you know having the hard way from a list perspective, so you know how many villains there is in my cluster, how many misconfiguration, and so on. I want to jump to the graph approach and say how many are public facing. Really, where is the most significant like? A chain in my Kubernetes cluster when I can have a, you know, an impact from a security point of view, or which actually security flow leads to a critical pass. And if you can actually be able to measure this like security posture at one point, you know, like taking the snapshot uh, of your cluster, it means you can do it over time and measure the changement. So you can really, you know, have a way to try to see from a, a, a specific point and measure if you're actually going into the right direction if you manage to build what we call like this security posture. Uh, the other thing is like, like I said previously, the scale. Uh, when you have one cluster and a few pods, it's fine. But when you have like hundreds of cluster with hundreds of thousands of pods, well, it's another story. And it's really traditional pen testing analysis is not working, so you need to be able to scale and automate. So the solution we came in really is, you know, to apply graph theory to offsec. Uh, and before we jump, I need also to do some quick uh, taxonomy over the graph. So what we call a graph is just, you know, this re representation of objects to form one another. And in a graph, we have two. I mean, we have three things which is really important. First, we have the vertices, and the vertices is also called node in common language. But for obvious reason, I would try to avoid because node is, is, is a Kubernetes node, and the vertices is like the abstraction of it. Uh, so avoid confusion, I would call it vertices. When you link vertices together, we, you have what you call the edges. Uh, and edges is really a presentation of what can you do from an attacker perspective from one entity to another entity. And when you link several edges and vertices together, you have what you call the pass. So in the kubehound environment, an entity is basically a Kubernetes resources that we are interested in. So we did not describe every single Kubernetes entity. We scoped it to seven. Um, which nodes, pods, container, uh, endpoint, and so on. Uh, and we made also our own, because sometimes it was a little bit easier. So for all the error back stuff, we called it like permission sets, which is based on role and role binding. So like I said, the edges are attacks. It's basically, what can I do from, a perspective, from an attacker perspective to improve my position from a security point of view? And we have also what we call critical asset. And critical asset, it's really what the attacker wants to have. It's like domain admin, but for Kubernetes environment. It's, you know, it's game over once you have it. It's really what you are looking for uh, from an attacker perspective. And the path to get it, it's what we call the critical path. So it's kind of the treasure map for attackers. Like They just want to follow this step to be able to get uh, the the critical asset and to take over the entire cluster. 
So if I put it in like in a graph perspective, we have endpoint, for example, which is linked to a container. A container can assume an identity which lead to uh, a cluster admin role. So we see that from endpoint to B, we can get to a critical ad to cluster admin, which is like what we call the critical path. So why do we create Kubehound? Why another tool? Uh, uh, again, and what is the goal of it? So the goal is really like you understand to track this visualization of everything that is linked and happening into your cluster from a security perspective. And why we wanted to create it, it's, I guess everyone is aware of Bloodhound, right? It's maybe one of the most well-known security tool in offsec world. And we say, well, why not apply the same recipe to the Kubernetes environment? Uh, because it was such a game changer uh, into the Windows security. And also back in the day, so we started the project two years ago, there was nothing existing that was available to build this model. So we want to call it like, you know, a, a, a good defense is always a good offense. Uh, and basically this is why we, we, we built this graph model to try to really bring this knowledge of offensive security to everyone, to blue teamers, even to red teamers who doesn't have the expertise into the Kubernetes environment. Uh, it's really, it's also like runtime calculation, so it means that every time, if there is a link somewhere from one entity to another one, Kubernetes will find it if the attack is referenced into the model. So you get this exhaustiveness of everything from a security point of view into your cluster. And the last one is really a snapshot. So you can take a snapshot of your cluster and it gives you a security view from this time. Like right? at this time, uh, you know what is your security posture. So how does it work? Uh, so pretty briefly, it's pretty easy. Um, you have like a binary on your laptop. We're going to scrape uh, and retrieve all the elements from the Kates API. Then we're going to put it into a, a, um, a database to compute the attack pass, like to do some pre-processing. And then we're going to build the graph. And then through UI, you will be able to visualize the attack pass. So it's pretty like standard work. And the goal of it is really try, because that's what you're going to get the first time you run in into your cluster, like this big, I don't know, Maybe some people will call it art, I don't know. Uh, but you know, big picture of relationship into your cluster. Uh, but it's not really, that's not what you want. What you want is this, is you know, like a precise map of where actually the security is, where the security failure is, and where you need to put attention. And really the tool enable you to really process with all this information and try to pinpoint where the security failure is. Uh, that's really the power of a graph technology, but you, you have to be able to, you know, process other results. So how do you do that? Basically, uh, you, we, you are using a genus graph, which is using Gremlin. Uh, does anyone is know Gremlin in the room? Oh, okay. Is there anyone an expert in the room I can bother after the conference? No. Uh, so yeah, basically Gremlin is really powerful language. Uh, so like I said, usually say, wow, it's really fun. You can do a lot of stuff, you know, like, uh, like the Gremlin in the movies look, oh, really cute. But you know, after like, uh, when you try to do something really complicated, you're like, ah, it's not so easy anymore. And you really want to hammer your head into the wall. So what we wanted to do is really try to make your life easier. And we created a domain specific language, a DSL on top of it. So we can actually translate, you know, Gremlin requests, which are, Let's, you know, let, let's be fair, like unreadable to something a little bit more easy to use. So for instance here, I'm just asking Kubehound give me from all the pods, all the critical paths, and I just want to get the first hundred of them. And it says the same into the Gremlin request, but uh, good luck to read this. So we put all the DSL into our website. Uh, we have all the different steps that you can use uh, with concrete example uh, to try to guide you through the process. Last thing I wanted to mention about the user experience, we are not a uh, front-end developer and we are kind of afraid of front-ends. Uh, we prefer back-ends. Uh, so, uh, I don't know if there is like any front-ends developers in the room, but yeah, we find it really hard. So we just try to use on -shelf stuff. So first we used an application G.V was not really suited our needs. So we jumped to Jupyter Notebook now. So we now we have a front end at Jupyter where you can actually host somewhere and run, you know, pre-built 
you know, notebooks to try to tackle and go through the process of, uh, of analyzing your Kubernetes cluster. And also we wanted to make your life easier. So all you have to do is have Docker on your machine, but I guess who does not now in 2000, uh, 14, uh, 24. Um, so now all you have to do is download the binary and run it and everything will be done for you. We spin up the container, do is ingest and connect, uh, and make available the UI. So you don't have to deal with all the bottle plate of running everything. Like everything will be taken care for you. So how does this happen? Um, actually it's pretty easy. Um, simple architecture will try to be as minimalist as possible. So you have a collector. Uh, like I said, the collector is just here to retrieve all the, key, the key Kubernetes element, uh, or you can analyze it from an offline dump, or maybe at some, some point you want to use ETCD uh, collector, but it's in a roadmap. Then we have the ingester, like I said previously, and the builder which will actually build the entire graph. So that's really pretty straightforward, um, um, like architecture. Um, so that's a little bit more in depth. Um, so, you know, again, the collector given to the, to the, to the DB, then you build the graph and then you make it available, you know, pretty straightforward. Simple. Uh, so you really, you're going to say, well, yeah, but do I really want to use it in this in my Kubernetes cluster? Like, what is the risk? So we know there can be a risk because you, we are really hammering the case API, but we really wanted to make it safe. So we put it a lot of safeguard to make sure that it will not overwhelm your server and bring down the whole cluster. So there is like limitation on size, rate limiting and so on. Um, it can be configurable. The default should be safe for your environment. Um, at least it is safe for ours. So basically, uh, don't be afraid to change it. And if you want to upscale it to make it quicker, do it at your own risk. Uh, so, okay, that's fun. We have an application that you can run on your laptop, but how do you want, I mean, we, we are talking about scale. Uh, so how do we really want to do it at scale? And this is why we want to introduce Kubernetes as a service of CAS. Um, so, Basically, how to use it, uh, it's basically we want it, all the changes we need to have, it's have, you know, the minimum impact from a security perspective. So it needs to have, you know, its own service account with limited access. Uh, it needs to be easy to deploy. Uh, and it needs to be scalable so you can have, you know, as many clusters as you want at the same time and be monitored back your home. So we made a few changes, which is not, so we just divided all the component into different bricks. So the first one, like I said, we have the collector. You can ship it basically as a cron job uh, into your Kubernetes cluster. So it will do the dump. We do it at Datalog on a daily basis, for instance. And then we push everything to a data storage. Uh, so S3 bucket, for instance, uh, on the cloud. And then we send a signal to the uh, ingester part to say, hey, there is a new dump that is being available. Can you ingest it? So it's going to retrieve the dump, do the ingestion and creation on the graph, and make it available directly into the UI. So you have like a central point where you can have all the ingestion and, and results. And on the other end, uh, you have all the collectors, and you can actually spin up as many as you want uh, into the, your whole Kubernetes cluster. So it is like uh, yeah, distributing collection, centralized ingestion, and you have a uniform source information, which is pretty great to beat KPIs and so on. So some metrics, uh, one what we have been using in Datalog, uh, for we are using Genius Graph with uh, memory backends. It means every single stuff is being stored in memory. Uh, we do that for uh, performance uh, reason, and also because to rehydrate what we have done is really quick. It takes less than a minute, so we don't really care if we have to you know reboot or lose the data in memory. We just reingest what was being dumped, and here you go. you have again all the results available uh, uh, into the tool. Uh, and also the dump is not that big. Uh, it represents 10 gigabytes of compressed file uh, for our, all our cluster on a daily basis, uh, for instance, for Datalog. So I know there is also a lot of security consultants who doesn't have the chance to deploy a collector into their, the environment they are uh, auditing. So basically, 
Again, you can, since we divided everything, you can do the dumping on one end when you are on the, cust on the customer doing the assessment, and then you can re-ingest it either locally on your laptop, or you can do it again on if you have like this big instance as your office, a consulting office, where you can do all the treatment of all the data that you manage to dump uh, and, and have. So we also wanted to adapt it from a um, consultant point of view. So how did we come up with everything with these attacks? So first, we, wanted, we needed to have a way to simulate everything uh, of the attacks that we found. And all the attacks that have been implemented are public ones. We didn't find it. We just managed to regroup everything and try to replay it into, uh, 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 yeah, uh, um, into a lab, uh, an environment where we control. And this is where Kind Cluster came to the rescue. A Kind Cluster is a really cool project. I don't know if people are aware of it, but it allows you basically to replicate a food Kubernetes cluster but on your laptop. Uh, so you can have multiple nodes running on your laptop, which is like pretty cool. Uh, so we use it to do our end-to-end -end testing. So every time we say, oh, there is this new container escape or this new attack pass, we implement and push new pods, volume, whatever is necessary into this cluster and do the research on top of it. You have to have, keep in mind there is some limitation, especially when you are running this on a Mac like me, there is a VM, so every time there is like kernel stuff involved, you will have some irritation and will not be able to reproduce, but for most of the attack, it's fine. And we wanted to share, so we have on our website, uh, basically a wiki base where we put everything uh, that is uh, linked to the research. So we have all the project, we have all the exploitation phases, step by step, how to check, what is the defense, and everything is being made available on our website. So we have like 26 attacks, 26 attacks that it is so far, and we have more in the pipe uh, to come later. So now that we have all the attacks, how do we prevent regression model? Because we don't want attack to disappear. So first, of course, unit test because you know all developers love unit test. Um, but unit test is not like great enough to cover all of it. So basically, we made like what we call system test. And system test is basically for every single PR, we spin up a vulnerable kind cluster. From this vulnerable kind cluster, we generate all the assets that is in it, so all the pod and, and endpoint in a Go language. Then we do this automated ingestion. So we run Kubeham with like everything live from all the different way of dumping and ingesting. And then we compare the result to make sure that we have what was expected. So it allows us basically to make sure that there is no regression when we add new code into the system and that all the model is still here and we don't deviate from what was the, uh, in, um, implemented uh, earlier. Um, I'm almost at the end, but I have a fun fact to share, and I like to call it when your CTO joins the party. Um, so, at first, like, Kubehound was a POC, uh, like, almost like more than one year ago. It was Neo4j, it was really slow, and we wanted to state, you know, what was the expectation for the first MVP and first, you know, real uh, V1 version? So we wanted full OpenStack. We wanted like one hour to ingest pod, which is like pretty reasonable and have, you know, pretty low time to dump all the Kubernetes object. But we had, so we managed to do it and we were pretty proud of ourselves. But there is always a but, of course. Uh, we have what we call, you know, OKRs. So you have to say for the next quarter what you are going to do. Uh, and you have like a small paragraph where you say you're going to work on X, Y, Z uh, um, for the next quarter. And we were like, oh, we want to do um, Kubernetes as a service because it's really slow. It takes more than an hour and we don't want to take one hour time. And the CTO came and read the doc, like uh, maybe five seconds and said, huh, that's funny because if I do some, you know, napkin maps, it should be take seconds and not hours. So you're like, huh, so it's like this high guy really high up in the hierarchy, like which basically runs a 5,000 people company, pinpoint like a really prob like a slowness, uh, slowness into your application. So you're like, okay, I should take this seriously. So we did some investigation and basically from a lot of different optimization, we managed to bring down to like to 35 minutes, 35 seconds. So this guy is actually like a CTO who run, like never heard of the project before, run five sentences of your project and say, huh, you should optimize it. 
So it was pretty fun. I have to say that we, may, we were maybe not laughing at first when we read the comment, of course. But it was really like a really a good thing to take, and we managed really to you know stand up the game uh, regarding uh, the tool. So that was uh, really pretty cool. Um, so the vision for the tool, what we want to do next, um, we have. Uh, a lot of stuff we want to do, we really want to build the UI, you know, like those minority report UI, you know, you know with the graph and stuff. Uh, that's really something that we want to do at some point, but like we said, it's going to take a lot of effort because, well, we don't like front end, uh, and development. We want also to be able to do diff checking. So, you know, we can measure it over time. So maybe you can have one diff and another one and you can just like, Show you the graph of what has been, uh, what is the difference between or evolution from a security and graph perspective. And maybe why not having into CI CD pipeline, uh, which is pretty much a trend, uh, right now. And a lot of, uh, other stuff also we have in the pipe, uh, for Cubound. So. I'm not doing any demo today uh, because we have a, I have a workshop this afternoon. So if you want to play with Kubernetes security or just want to play with Kubehorn and have more in depth and demo and stuff like that, don't hesitate to join me uh, this afternoon. Uh, so on the um, a class down there, uh, just in front of the of the stairs at 4 p.m. Uh, and we will be have some hands on work on Kubehorn and Kubernetes security. Thanks a lot for your time, and I will be available if you have any questions. I think we have time for a few. Yeah, does it output like... Um... <laughs> Let's say a, a jump in the graph is because you didn't implement the CAS benchmark number 12. Does it output that you failed at implementing this benchmark? Do you, can you... Can you output like compliance hardening advice, whatever cluster hardening advice? So we don't right now, but uh, since we have all the information into the reference table we have on the website, and you're not the first one to ask, uh, maybe that's something we should try to push and implement and have, you know, yes, CIS or whatever failing at some point. But as offsec people, we always, you know, want to move away from compliance benchmark stuff. Uh, but since you're not the first, uh, first, uh, last, I mean, not the first one to ask, that maybe something uh, cool that we might try to consider to implement. All right, and uh, I'll look for questions in a second, but you named up John, uh, John Lambert. Yes. And he has another quote which says, uh, everything an attacker does leaves a trace. So there's another workshop competing with yours this afternoon that allows a detection team to trace out all the, the steps of an attack like this and then find out how to detect it. So I'm just saying at quarter past four, there's an open tide workshop also that you can attend if you if you want to try to detect instead of using the tool to attack. Exactly. So yeah, any questions? Yes, one. Th thank you very much. Very, very interesting talk. Um, it, it because I'm old, it reminds me of the work people have done 30 years ago on attack graphs uh, in, in Unix environment, and then they, they were building these huge graphs to see you could hop from one workstation to another in order to eventually reach the, the server, right, which is conceptually similar. And the problems they were facing at that time was that people, when you were showing those graphs, people were saying, yeah, but this is very, very, very unlikely that this guy will do all these many hops to eventually get there before being seen. So I was wondering, um, how, how large is your graph? So how many hops do they have to do before reaching, you know, the holy grail that you are defining? Uh, because if that's large, then maybe you will have to do what they have done at that time, which is instead of just having path, you need to be able to measure and quantify the difficulty or the time it takes to go through that and maybe rejuvenate some of the work from 30 years ago that we're doing that actually. Yeah, actually that's a good question and that's something we want to also implement at, the, at some point. It's add some ponderation because we know all attacks are not equal. And for example, if there is a, so we have an attack where you, you want to brute force a token to try to, it's going to take a while, it's going to create noise. So we want to maybe create a score system where we can try to alight the most, um, 
the, the scenario which are make more sense and try to skip out the other one. So for now, all aqua are treated equal, but we know it's not the case from the real world, so we really want to put this ponderation system in place at some point um, to be able to, yeah, like you said, really showcase only the interesting one and try to skip out the unlikely one. All right, I think that's it. Thanks a lot, Julian. Thanks.